All right, so we're just going to give a second for people to start coming into this webcast. Thanks everyone for joining us here. Trying to mute so you all don't hear my husband on his sales call in the background. <laughs> all right. Go ahead, Anne. What were you going to say? Uh, sign of the times. I'm hoping yes. that there will not be a screaming baby or construction noise, which there was earlier this morning. So, uh, yeah. Um, all right. So we'll get started here. Um, I'm Rachel, uh, program director at Strong Towns, and we're so glad to have you for this webcast, How to Get Rid of Parking Minimums. Our featured presenters today hail from Edmonton, Alberta, and together they've played a role in successfully eliminating parking minimums in their city. So I'll introduce them really briefly here. Ashley Salvador is the co-founder and president of the Canada Backyard Housing Association, a nonprofit serving homeowners interested in building garden suites and other accessory dwelling units. And then Travis Fong is the co-founder and vice chair of the Canada Backyard Housing Association. And finally, Anne Stevenson is the director of strategic initiatives at the Right at Home Housing Society, which provides a range of affordable housing solutions to meet the diverse needs of individuals and families in Edmonton. Before I hand it over to our presenters, I'll just let everyone know that um, you can feel free to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom um, at any time during this presentation. And then at the end, we'll get to as many as we can. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ashley, Travis, and Anne. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, that was a great introduction. I don't know if we really need to add anything to that. Well, so, uh, and, uh, I worked at the city prior. Yeah, we should we should provide some context around that maybe. Um, and do you want to do you want to just provide that context as well, since your presentation is going to kind of stem from that? Sure. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for having us today. I'm really excited to be able to share the journey that we took in Edmonton to remove minimum parking requirements. So as Ashley and Travis mentioned. I was a senior planner with the city of Edmonton, leading the zoning bylaw team. Uh, so, so leading these uh, changes to our zoning bylaw to remove parking minimums. Uh, I've since left the city. I'm in a new role, uh, as Rachel mentioned, with the Right at Home Housing Society. So I'm gonna share uh, the experiences I had while, while on staff at the city, and then um, just uh, touching on a little bit after I left uh, the city as well. Perfect. Um, and yeah, on our side of things, as Rachel mentioned, Travis and myself, uh, we are the co-founder, well, co-founders, founders together of uh, Canada Backyard Housing Association. So we're very much in sort of the small housing ADU space. But that being said, we, we like to uh, use that as a bit of a vehicle to have conversations around larger city building issues, and that includes parking minimums. So let's get started. Okay, so just to start off, we wanted to provide a little bit of context around where we are, what, uh, what Edmonton is like as a city. Now, to help contextualize, you know, for our, our southern neighbor, uh, Alberta is the province that Edmonton is located in, and it's kind of known as the Texas of Canada, if that provides any context. Uh, so the province itself is dominated by oil and related industries. And the politics are among probably the most conservative in the country. That being said, Edmonton as a city, you could think of that as kind of the Austin of, of Alberta, okay? So it's somewhat more left leaning. Uh, it's a capital city where there are major employers uh, like the University uh, of Alberta and, and civic service is a, another major employment um, sector here. It's also a little bit of an every town, okay? So Edmonton is um, very typical when it comes to our development patterns. Uh, you can see similar patterns in cities basically across North America. Uh, we do have a really beautiful dense urban core shown in this photo uh, with the North Saskatchewan River running right through our city. In addition, we do have some traditional main streets as well. So these are kind of in our, our earlier build out. Um, I'll, I'll show you a map in a second that shows kind of our, our central core, mature neighborhoods, and then 
sort of newer suburban build out. But in these traditional main streets, they are walkable. You'll see a mix of kind of heritage and new buildings, uh, but it, it definitely is defined by that uh, mature character. And, and these are certainly in the, in the minority in the city, because um, as you'll see in a few moments, uh, Edmonton has expanded dramatically uh, over the last half century. Uh, and so most of that is characterized by your typical 1950 to 2000 suburban build out. Also, like most North American cities, we have sprawling low density residential, uh, as you can see from this aerial shot. It's got to be one of the best places in the world to be a driver. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, so we have some, some massive car oriented power centers, as you can see here, and really miles of ring roads and highway infrastructure. Um, so this next image can give you a little bit of a taste for, for how Edmonton has grown. Um, and again, not, uh, not you know, a, a standout city. This is very typical of most North American cities. On the left, that's our build out at 1974. And that's that mature core neighborhood that we were talking about. And then as you can see, progressing to 2014, we just kind of exploded. So in that period of time, uh, there were several massive oil booms. And uh, every time that happened, there was a massive expansion in suburban housing and Edmonton's population uh, has, has more than doubled uh, in this period of time. Mm -hmm. And not only obviously um, did, we, did we expand in terms of, of built form, but our roadways expanded with that. We're number one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, fun fact, Edmonton is actually a world record holder for the largest parking lot. Um, so arguably Edmonton's actually mar more car centric than the average town. Uh, so this particular world record is for, um, yeah, world's largest parking lot over 20,000 spaces. Yeah, so um, I'm actually not from Edmonton. I'm from Halifax over on the East Coast. And when I moved to Edmonton, uh, the first thing I said to Ashley was, wow, this has got to be the best city anywhere for driving because it is really built for drivers. And that is reflected in the mode share. So 75% of uh, individuals in Edmonton and households, their primary mode of transportation is with a private automobile. Um, and so, you know, that, that obviously factors into any discussion at City Hall. Uh, you know, there's a good contingent of people who want to defend um, kind of the car centric nature of the city. Uh, and, and that is certainly something that we chafed against uh, over the last 10 years while everyone was pursuing these parking uh, reductions. Mm -hmm. And not only are we car centric, but we're also politically centrist. So cheesy. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Travis. Yeah, so um, it's actually, like Ashley was mentioning, um, we are sort of an Austin of, of Texas sort of situation. And our city council reflects that. Yes, we do have some very conservative councillors, but we also have some progressive voices and generally speaking, a number of people who you wouldn't be able to necessarily pin down on that right left spectrum. Uh, and that tends to be how it is in municipal politics because there aren't so many people that, that parties have formed and these people are representing their communities for snow clearing, pothole filling, street safety, uh, and these things don't tend to like line up on a really nice political spectrum. So certainly we're centrist. Now, parking um, plays a part in the discussion of any development in the history of development in Edmonton. Every time something's coming forward to council, you can anticipate that that will be on the line of items that you're hearing residents complain about. Uh, and that certainly uh, is what is described here, kind of in our, in our newsreel. Uh, every time there's a thing and an article in the newspaper, there's concerns about lack of parking, parking flooding into the streets, um, just not enough space for the cars. So uh, that's always on the mind of counselors because those are the complaints that they're hearing about. Um, and so that's basically been the way that it has been 
for decades. And this is actually probably the start of it. So, you know, in a classic kind of Robert Moses, 1950s to 1970s fashion, uh, Edmonton got it in its head that it was going to build out this absolutely insane network of freeways. Um, and this was called the Mets plan. Uh, thankfully, it did not happen, uh, probably due to expense, but they really wanted to do it. And this, this kind of gives you an idea of, of what was uh, the zeitgeist of the time, what people were thinking, uh, which was basically the automobile is now our way of life. And so we better build a bunch of freeways and institute parking minimums. Um, and that kind of brings us on to, to the next uh, slide, which talks about the cost. Um, so one of the things that Edmonton did uh, when they were researching our parking situation, uh, which they didn't know was an oversupply then, was trying to determine you know, how much every stall cost and then how many stalls we weren't actually using. Um, and it turns out the cost is dramatic. So it's between $7,000 to $60,000 Canadian, uh, a stall, you know, depending on if you're just paving outside or if you're building an underground parkade, obviously that's considerably more expensive. Um, so even though much of the city is, you know, surface stalls out in the suburbs, uh, there's a humongous proportion that are actually in our downtown. So if uh, you look at the image on the bottom left, uh, a huge number of those stalls are underground parkades. So you can really see the dollar signs adding up. Um, but if you look at the other slides, these are kind of more residential contexts. And uh, this is actually just an amazing thing Ashley did. Um, we were kind of anticipating that there was going to be resistance uh, at a parking uh, urban planning committee. And Ashley was getting really upset with people trying to act like there was no parking in the city uh, because, of course, we drive and we are aware everywhere we go, there is so much parking. Um, and so we were hanging out at home on a very cold winter day. And Ashley just got onto uh, what is effectively Microsoft Paint and took some images off of. Uh, off of satellite and started covering all the parking areas. And once you actually go through and cover all the areas, you realize just how much there is. Uh, and I think this might have been on Strongtown's guide for how to talk about parking minimums. Um, so this got a lot of traction and really helped us uh, engage in the discussion around parking. So. Um, yeah, and for. You know, those are sort of the, the land use impacts of parking minimums um, and just really showing the sheer volume of space that we devote to cars. Um, but there's also huge impacts on businesses. So these two articles here are just examples of um, instances where local businesses ran up against minimum parking requirements. So, you know, this example on the on the right, um, I'm just recalling <laughs> this particular business owner. Uh, they wanted to, to reduce the number of stalls because they're kind of right on a, a nice main street or arterial road. Uh, they wanted to serve people in that particular community. They got lots of foot traffic, but there was a, a pretty hefty fight on their hands uh, when they tried to um, reduce those, those parking stalls. And, you know, it, it ultimately comes down to, to cost as well, because the, the longer your project is delayed, uh, the more cost that is accrued. So that's certainly the case in Edmonton, um, and, and that's not the only story. And that kind of brings us in for on the garden sweep piece, because these parking regulations affected us. Yeah, and looking at you know our space, which is the ADU garden sweep space, it definitely impacts residential development as well. So until recently, Edmonton actually required a minimum of two parking stalls to be provided with every new single detached home. So that's regardless of whether the owners actually wanted a parking stall or not. And in our world, you know, we see a lot of ADUs being built for aging seniors, uh, maybe a family member with a disability. Maybe they just live really close to transit and they literally don't own a car. Um, there's also instances of people being uh, bicycle commuters 
and they, they don't want to own a car. They have three bikes and that's their main mode of transportation. Uh, yet up until we removed minimums, they were forced to build a stall. And, you know, again, not only does that cost a lot of money, but it actually reduces some of the livable space. So instead of devoting space to, to humans for living, uh, we're devoting space to cars for parking. And uh, this is an interesting example. So this is a, a mosque here in Edmonton, and it was converted from an existing strip mall and former library space. So just a kind of a quirky example of where Eurocentric parking requirements dictated that this particular project have one parking stall for every four seats. Now, there's no seats in a mosque, right? So this actually led <clears throat> to a weird, weird reverse calculation being made on the number of parking stalls, which limited the number of worshippers. So parking was actually being prioritized over people's right to worship. Um, so we were joking that this is kind of the church of parking. And just some other strange examples of how parking requirements, they don't really have a firm rationale or rhyme or reason to them. Uh, so for example, this is a very Canadian example, but uh, curling. So you need to have, uh, what is it? Um, eight stalls per sheet of ice <laughs> for, for a curling rink. And similar strange rules apply for, for bowling lanes, for example where you need four stalls per lane for a bowling alley. And uh, the one we find just so, so strange is five parking spaces per hole on a golf course. Like, okay, these were, it, it seems like some of these were just pulled out of a hat um, and that there's no real, you know, scientifically backed or data-driven rationale here. And as each of these issues started popping up and people started realizing, you know, this is causing businesses to um, spend additional money where they don't need to, maybe it's just denying communities amenities where they need them. Community advocates started lobbying City Hall to take action. Okay, so it really resulted in a stream of motions from Council, over a dozen parking related motions in just a few years time. So rather than tackling each individual issue. Uh, whether it was parking minimums for, again, that restaurant, or maybe for an ADU or houses, uh, or maybe it was the mosque, city staff decided to take a different approach. So they actually recommended an entire review of parking. So instead of a sort of incremental one-off approach, let's do a comprehensive review of parking. And Anne was the one at the city leading this project. So we're gonna pass control over to Anne just give us one second. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, uh, I hope as everyone's seen, you know, Edmonton was a, a very typical town. Um, there were a lot of things actually working against us uh, to remove parking minimums, the very car centric built form, a long history of having parking requirements. Um, but these minimums really were getting in the way of, of businesses, of people's homes, of people's recreation people's religion. So we really felt as city staff, it was time to, to take a good, a good look at these. But we wanted to be sure that we were being very thoughtful in how we were framing those conversations. Um, sorry, Ashley, I don't know that I have control here. Uh, sorry, Anne, if you can just click once and then use the uh, arrow keys. There you go. Okay. Uh, Okay, there we go. Um, and so I wanted to sort of talk through um, three of the main approaches that we took to make sure that we could have a really constructive conversation about removing parking minimums. So I'm gonna talk about talking the talk. So that was really how we framed the discussion, uh, the reality check. So we conducted a technical study that gave us a really good sense of what was actually going on on the ground. And thirdly, sort of asking it right. So again, just being very mindful about how we framed a question that we put to, to the public. So we gave a lot of thought to how to have a constructive conversation around this. As a colleague put it, asking people how much parking they want is like asking them how much money they want. People are typically gonna say more. 
Um, but when you, when you tell people that to have more money, maybe you need to work longer hours or change cities, people begin to be able to start to trade off. Um, you know, yeah, the trade-offs for achieving this, this uh, better outcome. So we decided to create a similar trade-off uh, to talk to people about parking. We really drew from that classic project management maxim of fast, good, or cheap, and you can only pick two of those. So we landed on three key, seat, uh, key city elements that are influenced by parking minimums. So there's the availability of parking, the cost of homes and businesses, and the walkability of neighborhoods. And once we had uh, framed those three, oh, well, I'll, I'll go through to explain a bit more. So for abundant, that first one is pretty straightforward. Um, so uh, the amount of parking provided impacts the availability of parking. Uh, so some developments will have a lot of parking and that will typically be surface parking. There will likely not be a charge for it. And then other developments will have less parking and typically uh, it will come at a cost. The other city element that's really impacted by parking provision is the cost of development. So we shared with Edmontonians that uh, parking isn't free. Um, surface parking all the way up to underground parking comes with a cost and that cost escalates uh, the more structured or the more underground it is. And that really translates to higher prices for uh, home homeowners, home buyers, and also for the goods and services that we receive from businesses. And then the final, oh, I am advancing, I apologize. Uh, and then the final um, factor was walkability of a community. Um, so we talked about how when you provide a huge amount of parking, what that serves to do is spread the community out. So um, homes and businesses are further apart and also areas aren't as pleasant to walk through. So having defined those three features, um, we then, talked about how you can only achieve two of those at once. So again, back to that fast, good or cheap, um, we wanted to sort of look at how you can achieve two at once, but you can't achieve three at once. So the first pairing that we have is uh, economical and abundant. So when you combine those two, you have relatively cheap construction. So surface parking, no structured parking, um, and you also have lots of parking. It's um, uh, a huge parking lot, very typical of sort of a retail power center. But when you achieve those two things, cheap construction and abundant parking, you really can't achieve walkability. As we pointed out before, those huge surface parking lots make it really hard to walk from place to place and really spread out our communities. The next pairing is economical and walkable. So this type of development is similar to what we see on traditional main streets. So you have compact, uh, low to medium rise buildings, and some may provide parking, but others may not. Um, they could have been built before parking minimums were in place. So there is some parking, um, but not, not a huge surplus. So again, these areas are reasonably affordable to build. There's no underground parking. Um, so you have sort of affordable homes and businesses, and you also have very walkable communities. It's a much more compact area. But what you're losing out in this scenario is you don't have abundant parking. So it's much more limited and there's usually a price that comes with it. Then finally, the third scenario is when you combine abundant and walkable. So this would be a typical downtown development where you have high rise buildings with lots of underground parking. So, you know, Edmonton's downtown, for example, there is tons of parking to be had, um, but it is expensive and um, you are paying a premium for the construction in that area. So homes and businesses are much more expensive. So again, you've achieved abundant parking, uh, walkable communities, but you're not hitting that economical piece. So after we define these three city scenarios, we took them out to Edmontonians as part of uh, what we called a values and priorities survey. So the survey was administered in two ways. One was a statistically robust uh, random sampling uh, telephone survey. We had 801 responses for that. And then we also had an the same survey available online for people to opt in. And we were very close to about 796 respondents for the online open uh, link as well. Uh, and one of the, the big questions we asked people is, you know, looking at those three city scenarios, which one do you prefer? And the results were very interesting. 
Um, as you can see, scenarios one and two, so that was uh, scenario one is sort of the power center, lots of surface parking. Scenario two is the traditional main street. Those actually um, scored exactly the same. So 39% of people uh, ranked those as their number one choice, uh, followed by scenario three, that dense urban downtown at 19%. So when you first look at this, you might think, oh man, like that, those are such ambiguous results. What can you take from that? But there were two really important findings that we drew. So the first was that um, while parking was important uh, to Edmontonians, scenario two was the one scenario where abundant parking wasn't uh, one of the outcomes. And it actually ranked highest in terms of first and second choices for Edmontonians. So 79% uh, uh, of respondents chose it as their first or second choice compared to scenarios one and three that had 56 and 50% um, respectively, even though they both had abundant parking as one of the city outcomes. The other probably more important finding was that there was a diversity of um, city typologies that Edmontonians wanted. So some people really like the power center area with lots of surface parking. Some Edmontonians preferred the traditional main street and again, others preferred a dense urban core. And what this really illustrated to us is that parking minimums, um, well, removing parking minimums was actually the best way to be able to provide those three different city typologies for Edmontonians. When we have minimums in place, we just inevitably end up with only one type of city. Uh, whereas what we heard from Edmontonians is that there's actually a desire for a diversity of uh, city types. I'm sorry, can you hear that grinding noise or am I still clear? Yeah, just talk a little louder, it's fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry, multifamily living. Um, as part of this values and priority survey, we also uh, asked some other interesting questions that we got very interesting responses to. So the first was uh, whether Edmontonians were even aware that the city set minimum parking requirements. Uh, and it turned out only about a third were even aware that we had those minimums. Um, as a really basic question about who is best suited to determine how many parking stalls are provided. Again, only about a third of respondents felt that the city was best place to do that. Otherwise, they highlighted uh, businesses or, you know, homeowners or the owners of buildings. Also very interesting was we asked Edmontonians how easy it was to find parking at home, at work, uh, at shops and businesses. And despite the fact that, as Ashley and Travis mentioned, that, you know, every public hearing, uh, you know, people come, they complain about parking, they worry about parking availability. Uh, when we asked them, do you ever have trouble finding parking? The answer was actually no, that, that finding parking was, was pretty easy to do around town. The survey also found that parking was important to Edmontonians, but not to the exclusion of everything else. So the diagram on the right, this sort of heat map, shows a derived importance ranking. And number one and two are about the availability of parking at home. Those, those came through very strongly. But the third and fourth ranked uh, items actually have to do with um, having options for getting around. So uh, access to transit, biking or walking and walkable neighborhoods as a standalone uh, as number four as well. And that came before the fifth ranked, which was the availability of parking at shops and businesses. So again, I, this survey really allowed us uh, to see that, that parking, you know, there are high emotions around parking uh, but it is not the single most only important thing uh, to Edmontonians. So ultimately our values and priorities survey allowed us to sort of step away from the argument over the single stall and talk about parking as it relates to our whole city and get people to think about the type of city they want and how parking fits within that. Are we still doing okay on sound? It's... Yeah, it's all right. Oh, I'll just keep going. Um, so that was our, our first big piece. Um, so sort of, again, talking the talk, having a really uh, open um, and curious conversation about how Edmontonians felt about parking in Edmonton. The next uh, piece that we took on uh, was the reality check. 
So this was a detailed technical study looking at what uh, is currently happening with parking supply and demand in Edmonton. As a first step to this, we wanted to understand where the existing parking minimums came from. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were using methodologies that were as rigorous or more rigorous than what was used to set the existing minimums. Uh, and this led to just an incredulous um, uh, investigation, I guess. So we first found that Edmonton's minimums were set through a study that was done in 1974. Um, so this was a time when Edmonton's population was about half of what its current population is. And there was no uh, light rail transit, um, no bus or a different bus network at the time. So just a, a vastly different city. Um, the study also had an interesting methodology of how they established minimums. So as a first step, they looked at car ownership using the census data and they plotted what the average uh, car ownership rate was per unit, depending on the area of city that it was in. Um, so, so this makes a lot of sense. This, is, this methodology to me seems like a good approach. You see what the demand is, which is understood through what car ownership rates are, and uh, you, know, you go from there. But unfortunately, <laughs> this, there was a, a massive leap of logic, if you can even call it logic, where, as you can see here, so uh, the study found that bachelor unit uh, car ownership went from about 0.3 to 0.5 cars per dwelling, depending on which part of the city uh, the building was located in. And yet, the study ended up recommending an across the board one space per unit uh, requirement. So already uh, the parking minimums we know are going to vastly outstrip what the actually uh, the actual observed demand is. Similarly, uh, with three bedroom units, again that sort of ranged from uh, you know 0 0.1 to 1.2 cars per unit, but again the final recommended uh, minimum requirement was 1.8, so so well above what was being observed. Um, and those, those are the minimum requirements that were in place until earlier this year um, with some variations, but, but basically this was, this was the so-called evidence that our minimums were based on. And unfortunately, we can't even sort of laugh that off as something that happened 50 years ago uh, when, when the world was so different and they had such different standards. Uh, in 2011, Edmonton, introduce minimum parking reductions for transit oriented development areas. Um, so again, within the past 10 years, uh, but again, the, the methodology used to set those, it turns out that we essentially copied and pasted from another city's TOD reduction. This is a city that has three times Edmonton's population, a vast public transit network. And, and then that, that study itself, was based on self-reported car ownership levels, which in some cases had less than 15 respondents. So we're talking about just, just insignificant, unreliable, not robust data that was used to set TOD standards in another city, which we then just copied and pasted over despite the differences in our context. So the good news through this investigation was that it was very clear that the bar was set incredibly low. Uh, so when we went out to structure our technical study, um, we, we wanted to make it as robust as possible. And we realized that, you know, we could do, we could do some pretty, pretty good investigation, pretty good evidence base that would certainly surpass what the current standard was. So to, to get ready for our technical study, the first thing we did was to um, select some sites to survey. So we wanted a mix of commercial um, sites and also residential sites. We wanted a selection of sites uh, based on different characteristics that are assumed to influence parking demand. So for example, we selected sites with uh, a range of uh, transit access, walk scores, uh, density levels, um, and across all areas of the city. So core, mature neighborhoods, and outer suburban neighborhoods as well. 
We also want to understand how different types of businesses would impact uh, parking. So we looked at sites with and without restaurants, for example, um, healthcare services, which are typically seen as, as high drivers of parking demand. We also selected 10 sites that had the same national uh, donut franchise. So Canadians on the line will know Tim Hortons. Um, we wanted to just, again, sort of control as many variables as possible. So we figured a franchise selling the same product, same level of popularity uh, across the city would give us sort of a baseline uh, control. One of the risks we recognized in our site selection was that we could be accused of bias. So, you know, city staff are only choosing sites that we know have enough parking. So we opened it up to Edmontonians and invited them to submit their crowdsource data. So that way, if someone had, you know, that one parking lot that was always full, they could go, they could count the parking and they could prove to us that, yeah, there's terrible parking congestion. Uh, we ultimately had pretty low uptake on that opportunity, uh, particularly for commercial sites. But what was great about the crowdsourcing opportunity is that 18 individuals uh, conducted counts at their condos or apartment buildings. And that gave us access to underground parkades that we otherwise were really struggling to get into. We had uh, sent letters out to landlords, to condo boards, and just hadn't received much uptake. So those 18 data points uh, were, were very helpful. Uh, the other piece that we wanted to factor into our technical study was the fact that we are a winter city. Um, we knew that if we only conducted counts during the summer, we could be accused of, uh, again, not considering the winter context. Uh, it's easier to walk or take the bus or take a bike during the summer, but what happens in the winter when everybody supposedly has to drive? So um, we, uh, out, of, out of the surveys that we did um, of commercial sites, we did 107 commercial sites in the winter, and then we resurveyed 20% of those in the summer, uh, just to be able to see if weather played, played a strong role. So ultimately we surveyed 340 unique sites. So that included um, sites that we went out with teams to survey directly. We also pulled some information from development permit applications where parking observations had been included. And uh, yeah, ultimately we had over 1800 uh, data points. So we took all that data and we got Nelson Nygaard to crunch the numbers for us. And the results were, were I mean, wonderful for me, <laughs> um, but, but really interesting. Um, so the biggest finding was that only uh, across the, so across all the sites we surveyed at the peak, peak occupancy, only 40% of the spaces that we uh, measured were, were ever occupied. So um, that's looking at a whole, uh, the whole pool of parking spaces. Um, and even when you drilled down um, and looked at individual parking lots, there were some that were very congested that were um, uh, full at their peak time, but that was 7%. So only 7% of uh, the parking spaces we looked at ever achieved optimal occupancy. So that's the orange line shown on the graph, which is about 90% occupancy. That's, that's a standard that, that speaks to efficient use of parking. And only 7% of sites ever hit that at their peak time. Um, the rest were, as you can see from the dashed red lines, at a much lower um, median utilization rate. We also, a bit more surprisingly, uh, found that there was no relationship between parking utilization and access to transit, walk score, density. Um, there was huge variability uh, of sites immediately adjacent to transit versus far away from transit. So anyone who can read a scatter plot uh, graph can see that the, this is a very, very poor relationship, very low uh, causational relationship. This shows the transit score, but it was the same for density uh, and for walk score as well. We also found that the context of uh, the city wasn't a huge factor either. So as you can see from this uh, map, um, there's a lot of variability sort of 
between different areas of the city and within different areas of the city themselves. So you can have a red dot immediately next to a blue dot in the so same area of the city, same context of the city, um, but very different parking utilization requirements. Um, most interestingly, again, so trying to control for, for every other factor we could think of, um, there is still very little or basically no consistency between the 10 Tim Horton sites that we observed. So again, national franchise, you'd think there, there would be some sort of correlation or some sort of uh, similarity between those, uh, but there was not very, very weak relationship uh, between those sites. So again, our, our technical study really revealed that there was no evidence to support minimums based on geography, based on uh, urban context, on business type or on housing typology. And what we, we surmise is that there is variability uh, from different parking lots, but it has much more to do with the popularity of the establishment, the business model, whether they're uh, attracting local business or regional business uh, on demographics. So stage of life that people are in and also just lifestyle choices. And so while all of these factors are very important in influencing parking demand, they aren't ones that we can readily regulate and certainly not not predict in advance of development actually being constructed, which is when minimum parking requirements are applied. So we, we now had sort of this preliminary values and priorities survey data from uh, Edmontonians. We now had all this technical data as well. So, so for us, that was really just the baseline uh, data and information we needed to go out and talk to Edmontonians about minimum parking requirements. So once again, though, we wanted to be really careful about how we were asking that question. So we definitely didn't want to ask how much parking should be provided with new homes and businesses. Because again, you get into a quantitative argument, oh, there needs to be more, more parking. Um, we might as well be asking people again, how much money do they want? So instead we boiled it down to what is ultimately a simple question, but how should parking for new homes and businesses be regulated? So this is what we landed on, uh, thinking about how we regulate parking rather than how much we regulate. We also wanted to be really careful that um, the idea of removing parking minimums, so no parking minimums, didn't mean no parking. So that was something that we ran across quite often in talking to members of the public. Said so no parking minimums, I think, no parking, we need parking. Um, so to deal with that, we actually chose a new term. So we called it open option parking. And we felt that this term better reflected that um, removing parking minimums, again, doesn't mean removing parking. It just means allowing homeowners and businesses to make choices about the amount of parking that's right for them. We also reflected on the fact that people are more comfortable when change comes one step at a time. And so we created this graphic that has the different options for regulating parking. So minimum parking requirements, open option parking and maximum parking requirements um, to show again, just the honest truth that open option parking is not that radical, that uh, it's not anti-car, it's not pro-car, it's not anti-car, it's just um, allowing people to make those decisions for themselves. Uh, and this visual really helped to capture that, again, open option parking is a bit of a, a middle, of the, middle of the road uh, option. We were also um, really cognizant of the the concern that comes up quite often with new development that not enough parking will be provided and it will spill over onto adjacent streets. So we recognize that that, that is a risk. Um, it was entirely possible that by removing minimums, not enough parking would be provided and adjacent streets would be impacted. We talked a lot though, that the city has many tools in their toolbox to deal with that scenario. Um, so here we switched over to an e-park system. So there's metered parking, there's time restricted parking, um, residential parking programs. So again, the public streets, uh, the city can use, use various tools to make most efficient use of, of those spaces if congestion becomes an issue. Um, and as strange as it sounds, it's, you know, it's actually, 
positive that it can be done in a reactionary way. So we don't know what the parking impact of a new development will be, but once it's up and operational, if there is an impact, we have these tools to deal with it. Uh, conversely, we highlighted that there's a huge risk of overestimating how much parking is needed for development before it's constructed. And once you've built it, once you've spent all this money on this massive parkade or a huge surface parking lot, there basically are no tools to mitigate that risk. Um, it's just there and it's going to be there until the building gets torn down or can, you know, so few things that it could be converted to. Um, so as much as there is a risk of parking spillover, there's also a huge risk of overbuilding uh, parking that then becomes uh, underutilized. So with all that framing in place, oh, I'm sorry, we also focused on the fact that, that change happens gradually. Um, so minimum parking requirement, all the existing parking spaces weren't going to disappear overnight. Uh, open option parking would only apply to new development as individual sites were redeveloped. Uh, so we took that question out. It was ultimately just a four, four question survey that we put to Edmontonians. We first asked them uh, of the three approaches, minimum parking requirements, open option and maximum parking requirements, what their level of support was for each of those approaches. And as you can see, open option parking received the highest uh, strongly support and somewhat support out of the three options. And when we asked Edmontonians to pick just one of the three, um, open option was the most frequently selected single option at 47%. So at this point in the process, um, I was feeling pretty great. Uh, I felt, you know, we had public opinion on our side. We had some really robust data to underpin our recommendations. And an initial report back to council, uh, we heard some, some solid political support. Um, but there was something on our list that we did not think about, and I'm curious if anyone can guess what that is. Um, and that was internal buy-in. And so we had had a lot of internal conversations uh, with folks sort of from frontline staff to senior management. And the, the concerns didn't necessarily come as a surprise. We'd, we'd had a lot of conversations over the course of the project with internal uh, stakeholders. But what I hadn't appreciated and what I hadn't realized is that when people had shared their concerns, I felt that I had given them, you know, the technical study, the uh, survey findings, um, but that wasn't actually allaying the concerns and the fears. And so to sort of meet this internal resistance so late in the game was pretty brutal. And it was honestly just like hitting a brick wall. Um, in, in retrospect, on reflection, I can see that, you know, there were some really obvious things that uh, were at play here. So one of them was people just feeling a bit caught unawares with our recommendation to remove minimum parking requirements. Uh, some of that was bad luck. We had a changeover in our department head. Um, so, so, you know, she hadn't been brought along in the process. Um, a lot of that was also just on us. We, we hadn't been communicating consistently with senior management about uh, the project progress. Also, interestingly, was a real sense of threatened professional expertise. And, and not just from, not to uh, stereotype, but this wasn't just transportation engineers. Uh, this was a lot of planners. So, you know, folks that were committed to, to urban crystals, and sorry, not that transportation engineers aren't either. Um, but it was across the spectrum and, and, you know, on reflection, it makes so much sense to me that these individuals had been implementing parking minimums for, for their whole careers. And we're suddenly trying to tell them that these standards were, were obsolete. Um, and that, that's, that's a really hard message to hear, even if, even if they themselves are complaining about those minimum regulations, um, it's really hard to have someone else come along and just say everything you've been doing. Uh, hasn't been making sense. And, and then at the end of the day too, just personal reactions. Um, people had personal opinions. They're drivers too. They have trouble finding parking sometimes. Um, also just a fear of change. It's a, it's a human, uh, human nature and a totally natural um, uh, response. So, so all of those factors were in play. And in retrospect, uh, I, you know, should have been prepared for those, should have expected those. 
Um, but at the time I was just very frustrated. I was very frustrated because in my mind, it was so clear. Uh, the evidence was there, the public opinion was there. Uh, it, was, it was just, yeah, clear as crystal to me. But, um, you know, again, I, I sort of had an answer for every question, had the data, had the opinions, but I was forgetting that I had been living and breathing this project for close to two years at that point. And, you know, what was obvious to me was actually accrued over a very long journey that, that not everyone had been on with me. So my reflection uh, from there is um, some takeaways to share with others who may find themselves in a similar situation is just to expect big emotions. Um, it's, it's inevitable, it's nothing to hide away from, but just, just be prepared for them. Uh, I also think it's really important to acknowledge, track and mitigate impacts. So again, a lot of our frontline staff uh, were uh, legitimately concerned about getting a lot of angry phone calls. Um, so, so just spending time actually talking to people, we offered at one point to, to uh, handle those calls. So again, it's easy as a policy planner to sort of sit back and, and make these decisions that have impact on the frontline staff, um, but to actually offer to step up and stand in their shoes uh, was, was very helpful at a certain point. Um, and if there are ways to mitigate that, again, with their workloads by finding other resources that can respond to concerns. Also, what's really interesting is just giving people some time. So, so there was sort of a period of time where, you know, there was no new technical studies done, there were no new surveys done, all the information was there and people just needed time to digest it. Um, so, so just giving people that space while at the same time staying persistent. So not letting it fade away, not letting it fall off people's radar, but just giving them the time and space to digest uh, is a huge, huge benefit. And of course, keeping up some external pressure so that it doesn't just fade away. And with that, I'm going to pass back to Ashley and Travis. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, so speaking of that external pressure, uh, while Anne was pushing for these changes on the inside, we knew that we had to generate some public support and encouragement from the outside as well. Um, so, you know, all too often administration will bring forward, again, a very logical, rational, data-driven amendment to council. And, you know, council will hear from members of the public who speak in opposition, whether that opposition stems from place of fear, uncertainty, misunderstanding. And this change in particular, it was too important for something like that to happen. And so. the funniest thing happened. <laughs> we were all in urban planning committee, uh, which is the thing before public hearing when it would become policy. And we were in support of it. The community organizations were in support of it. All of the industry, the industry members. development members. Um, so as Anne said, you know, they really did have broad-based support and buy-in, uh, which is why it was so strange when it actually got kicked back um, and didn't go forward to a public hearing right away. So in that time, we actually decided, okay, let's, let's generate a bit of a campaign here just to really give this one final push to make sure um, it, can, it can go through. So this, uh, this graphic here shows just one of the the communications pieces that um, that we put out into the world. Again, it was sort of a, an education uh, communications campaign just to make sure people really understood, you know, why are we doing this? Uh, what's the what's the rationale behind it? Trying to dispel some myths as well um, and really give it one final shove. So it was really a great compliment to the communication that the city had already done. Uh, so as Anne spoke about earlier, they put out some really excellent communications pieces. Uh, so this is a nice compliment. And of course, we distributed this really widely to the public, um, to community members, and it, it did get a, a decent amount of circulation. So, next slide. Can you? Uh, yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, and another, another thing we really tried to do during this period was make it very personal and tangible and real for Edmontonians. Uh, so you saw this graphic before, but again, super low tech, 
but it, it does help people see the sheer amount of space we're allocating to, to automobiles and cars. Um, and, and not only in you know, our mature neighborhoods, but in our downtown, in our uh, sort of more mature main streets, uh, even in suburban areas as well. So people could see their particular context uh, and sort of identify with that. Now, while this was all going on, um, one thing that we did as an organization was actually try to empower Edmontonians to, to come and support this change. Uh, so as I mentioned, all too often, council hearings are, are really typified by, uh, by folks coming out in opposition and speaking against change. So what we wanted to do was rally folks to send letters, come and speak at council, um, so that council could actually hear from general Edmontonians, not just, you know, industry organizations or uh, keeners like us who are very involved in urban planning. Uh, it's just general Edmontonians are supportive of this as well. So as an organization, you know, one thing that we aim to do is actually give people the tools and know-how to engage with that process. So, you know, we've held sessions on um, how to write a successful letter to council how to, even things like how to sign up to speak for a public hearing and making it a little less scary uh, and a little more accessible to, to the general public. Um, that's something we did. And- We you haven't heard by the way. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, I mean, here. yeah, ultimately being able to um, elevate those voices is something that really strengthened the message that, that the city was putting forward, that all these other industry organizations were putting forward. And, you know, we were really public about it as well. So in this period where, you know, Anne described it as everyone just kind of needed time to think. Uh, <laughs> they needed time to digest this, uh, this fairly significant, but very logical and pragmatic change. Uh, so in that period of thinking, well, we were just trying to influence people's thinking even more, <laughs> to be quite frank. Uh, so, you know, we were very vocal about being kind of public advocates for this change. Uh, you know, as someone who is outside of City Hall, brings a, a slightly different voice and, and flavor to the conversation. Uh, and I remember, you know, doing six interviews in one day leading up to the public hearing, and everyone was so concerned about the consequences and just the chaos that would get, uh, was going to ensue, there's going to be no parking. So there was a lot of um, trying to quell those fears in the lead up. So it was almost like, we got all the fears out on the table. We had that conversation prior to the public hearing so that when we got to the public hearing, everyone was like, okay, I kind of understand this. My fears have been addressed, let's go. Um, and another thing, we were very careful in the way that we framed the issue. So um, as Anne said, you know, removing parking minimums, it's not a declaration of war against the car. You know, this was about choice. We use the language of freedom quite a lot. We talked about cutting red tape uh, and just being more efficient with our tax dollars. So those are sometimes the arguments that people need to hear. It's a market-based solution. That sounds great. Let's vote for that. <laughs> exactly. And at the same time, you know, you can provide those dollars and cents arguments, but then other people need to hear that, well, this is a sustainable choice. This is gonna lead to more walkable, healthy communities. This is about climate action. So being able to um, have those different conversations and present those different arguments and rationale to different audiences, that was something we really strive to do. Uh, and Anna, and I think you're this on is, mute uh, there. This is yours, you're on mute though. <laughs> we still got Anna on mute here. There, there we go. My buttons disappeared, I apologize. Um, so, so as I mentioned, at this point, I had um, uh, taken a new position away from the city with an affordable housing provider. So, so joining in on the amazing work that Ashley and Travis had done to mobilize the community, I was able to speak from an affordable housing provider's perspective as well uh, and showed this image uh, to, to mayor and council. So it's um, the parkade, the underground parkade of a permanent supportive housing development where virtually none of the residents own parking, but they were required to build a 50 vehicle underground parkade that added about a million dollar expense uh, to an affordable housing project. We also had a great uh, local community advocate, uh, Kirsten Goa, 
who put it so well, she said, we've solved the problem of affordable housing for cars. Um, so just some, some really emotive, uh, resonant messages that, that hit council just um, in the right way. And um, as Ashley and Travis mentioned, we sort of were able to get out a lot of that angst before the public hearing happened. And we actually had no, my recollection is no speakers in opposition, um, although there, were, there was one that wanted us to go further and implement maximums. Um, so, so, and then about a dozen people speaking in support. And uh, although it was an empty chamber because of the pandemic, uh, we did have a unanimous vote from mayor and council supporting these changes. So phenomenal leadership on behalf of, of our mayor and council um, and, and really the culmination of what was a huge team effort. So I wanted to give a quick shout out uh, to my former colleagues at the city of Edmonton. Uh, and I'm, there are more that I know I'm missing. Um, but just phenomenal work uh, by so many professionals on so many different areas of the city. Um, we also had excellent uh, consulting support from Advanness uh, Social Marketing. They did our values and priority research, uh, cut and paste our graphic designers. So you, so you would have seen some of the images that they developed for us. Uh, and Nelson Nygaard with um, the technical study. So again, just a great, uh, great team effort there. There was also tons of support from civil society organizations um, and everyday citizens as well who took part uh, both in the surveys and, and sharing their voices uh, with mayor and council. But we know not every city will, will be as lucky as we were in terms of having all these players at the table. So I'll pass back to Ashley and Travis for some thoughts about what we do if the city isn't there and the city isn't there with its consulting budget. For sure. Um, so we do have some takeaways and just in the interest of time, I'm going to go this to the slide here. Um, so yeah, as Anne said, if we if we remove sort of the, the city or even sort of industry organizations, and maybe you are just really passionate about getting rid of parking minimums in your particular city, but you don't have um, those detailed technical studies, you don't have sort of the, the background documents that you can point to to say, look how irrational this is. <laughs> uh, what can you do? So the first thing you can do is just ask about current standards. Okay, so even just throwing that question out there, uh, sometimes it can kind of set off a, a bit of a ripple effect where administration will then question, you know, okay, why, why do we have these current standards? Um, what's the data behind them? Were they determined 50 years ago? Maybe our context has changed uh, since 50 years ago. So asking that question can be a, a great way to start. And the second thing, don't try to do it alone. So as you saw on the previous slide, you know, there were a number of uh, partners and stakeholders involved in this conversation. And by no means was it just, you know, us at Yank Garden Suites, it was a collaborative effort. Um, and, you know, as, a, as one of those civil society organizations, it can feel a little lonely, uh, but there are allies out there. So finding those allies early on having those conversations and establishing a bit of a network of folks who are supportive of these kinds of changes can really move that conversation forward. And the third point is empower stakeholders to share their personal stories. Okay, so the power of personal stories, uh, I, it, it's so critical. Um, being able to uh, bring, you know, maybe someone who wants to build an ADU, fully accessible ADU for their grandmother uh, and then they're running up against parking regulations and that's going to prevent them from living in a safe, accessible environment. So having those types of stories out on the table, having the stories around local business owners uh, whose projects are, are really denied because of these regulations, getting it uh, to that personal level can, can change the conversation as well. Communicate in ways that people can understand. So this gets back to what I was saying around um, framing the conversation. So some people, they want to hear dollars and cents, and that's okay. Other people, they want to talk about the environmental benefits and community well-being. So tailoring your conversation and, and understanding that those two lenses actually end in the same result. You know, they actually are supportive of one another. 
that's important because oftentimes we'll say that, well, the dollars and cents arguments are at odds with the environmental or social arguments. But in the case of something like parking minimums, um, they're actually really related and intertwined. Uh, and point to other examples. So, you know, one thing that we're so proud of <laughs> in, in Edmonton is we're one of those examples now, uh, mostly thanks to Anne and her team, but all these other organizations uh, help boost that as well. So, you know, after this change came through, I started seeing things on social media and, and other urban planners in Canada pointing to Edmonton and saying, well, if they've done it. Why, why can't we do it? Uh, so pointing to other, other cities, not just in, in your country, but you know, you can point up to Canada too, if, uh, if you're in the US, to, to cities like Edmonton that are taking this step for the rest of us. And certainly if you're in a winter climate and yeah. the argument is being made that it can't be done in a winter environment, I can assure you that Edmonton is much colder and snowier. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, and the last point is just around creating alliances and that really links back up to the, the don't try to do it alone piece. So all of the studies that I referenced uh, in terms of our survey, uh, technical study and our recommendations report, those are all available on edmonton.ca slash making space. Uh, really encourage you to make use of those resources any way you can. Uh, copy and paste if it fits for your city. Um, we yeah, just wanna make sure that you have access to those resources. Um, yeah, really appreciate you all joining us and looking forward to questions. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we can go ahead and if you guys wanna stop screen sharing so everyone can see our lovely faces. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation very thorough. And um, we've gotten a ton of questions. We'll start with what we can get to now. Let's see. Um, Raleigh asked uh, whether parking spaces, let's see. So he's talking about in Austin, there are a series of multi-level parking garages on the edge of a property, but no parking in front of the stores, except for a few outliers. Um, can, can communities uh, set up a structure where um, businesses can get credit for parking nearby, just not on the owner's property. Have you guys, did you guys, have you encountered that sort of solution? Yeah, so we, we had investigated what's frequently known as parking in lieu. Well, okay, actually parking in lieu is a bit different. I think maybe what um, the question is more sort of around shared parking. And so that was something that we struggled with. So the way that Edmonton's zoning bylaw regulations were set up, if you had a restaurant that was busy in the evenings and an office who had a parking lot that was uh, you know, busy during the days and empty during the evenings, those two businesses weren't actually able to share the same parking spaces. Each, uh, you know, the restaurant and the office had to each have specially designated parking spaces. Uh, and so clearly that's, that's not an efficient use of those parking stalls. So with the changes we brought in, we removed that distinction. Uh, we called it accessory parking or non-accessory parking. And basically now a stall is a stall is a stall. Whoever can make use of that uh, is welcome to it. So that, uh, even if that's sort of a preliminary change that your community can make before removing minimums altogether. Um, so, so ways of looking at that is just sort of minimums uh, per square footage of building rather than you know, per individual business within that building. Got it. Thanks. Um, this is another question specifically addressed to Anne uh, from Andrew. What would you recommend to cities wanting to update their parking policy, but that may need to do it on a shoestring budget due to COVID? Um, I know you guys shared some, some good thoughts at the end too. So maybe this has already been answered, but what can people do if they can't do like a whole study in the way that you all did? Yeah, well, it's a great question. You know, COVID and the pandemic, um, we know how hard it's impacted local businesses and how many barriers they faced and, um, you know, local economies are really hurting. So that can actually be a way um, to accelerate the conversation. So removing parking minimums can be about supporting local businesses by removing uh, this red tape that gets in the way of new businesses opening. So in that way, you don't really need um, ton, like a, a really thorough technical study. Uh, for example, you can even just look at 
you know, how many uh, businesses are having to apply for permits to do a change of parking, how many permits are getting refused or how much time is that taking them. So you can look at some of that process detail. Um, and just for a bit of context as well, we, we ended up spending the whole budget for our project was about $175,000. So not, not shoestring, um, but again, our technical study was about, it was about 50,000. So uh, again, we, we could have had more crowdsourcing. So I think there are ways to, uh, to make it a bit leaner, but again, going back to what Ashley and Travis were talking about, focusing on some of those more emotive things, cutting red tape, helping the local economy, you can even get away from having to do a full technical study. Thanks, yeah, that makes sense. Um, this question comes from Todd. Did you have to write special language into the ordinance to prevent a past development or applicant mm -hmm. from claiming foul based on money that they had spent to make their past project happen? And I'm assuming he means like mm -hmm. to uh, be in line with the previous parking requirements. That's very interesting. So, or, you know, yeah, they were required to build, I'm thinking of that affordable housing development, they were required to build these 50 stalls that they don't need, could they come back and sue the city? That wasn't a risk that, that we identified. Um, our regulations are such that whatever is in place, the day your development permit is approved are the standards that, that apply, so they don't apply retroactively. Um, what was interesting is we did did have to think through if people wanted to repurpose their existing parking spaces, would they have to get a new development permit? Um, because their original development permit said you have to provide this many parking stalls. Um, so there are definitely some process things around that, but but we, yeah, our, our legal team didn't raise, raise that as an issue. Um, it does raise a really interesting question though. I mean, going back to, um, I don't know if there's opportunities to litigate on the existing parking minimums. They have a huge impact on businesses. And if they're not founded on evidence, um, can that be challenged? Uh, can municipalities be challenged on why they're implementing their current minimums? I, an interesting question for someone else to investigate, I think. I saw a good question in the chat around accessible parking and accessible parking spaces provision. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the way it was in Edmonton was for a certain quantity of parking stalls, you would be required to uh, provide a certain quantity of accessible stalls. And uh, unlike a lot of parking, accessible parking is highly necessary. Uh, so the city of Edmonton did address this. So it kind of um, worked backwards on on like the unit types or the dwelling units that would be involved or the commercial unit and it worked backwards from there with a, a supposed parking requirement that might exist and then applied the accessibility standards uh, to that number uh, for the required number of stalls so uh, yeah that is that is absolutely something that uh, you don't want to gloss over uh, if you're a municipality moving forward with that uh, in, at least in Alberta, that's under provincial jurisdiction. Uh, so it's something that had to be had to be dealt with. Yeah, thanks very much, Travis. Um, let's see, this question comes from Christy who asks, are you using parking pricing changes to address problem areas? Great question. And I, I saw a related comment to around the relationship with our parking authority. And so the way Edmonton is structured, the, so the area where I worked, where we were setting the parking minimums, we, we have a division between on street parking, so public parking and off street parking, which is parking provided on private property. And, and inev inevitably there is that relationship between, between the two. So again, if a new development comes in, uh, the parking provided on private property is inadequate to meet the demand, then it's spilling over onto the public streets. Um, and so that was, again, one of those, those relationships that was really important to build. Um, we were lucky in the sense that the parking authority was about to uh, undergo a review of their uh, policies and pricing. Um, so there was a real opportunity to, uh, to align those two um, processes. Um, 
Yeah, and and you know, pricing pricing is an incredibly effective tool for managing uh, parking demand, um, and and we would argue that uh, on street parking, public parking is the most adaptable and fluid uh, resource that we have for parking. Gotcha. Um, quick question: Can one of you drop a link to Edmonton's documentation mm. in the chat? That would be super helpful. I will do um, that. Thank you. Let's see. Feel free if any of you spotted, there's been so many questions flowing in. Otherwise, I will jump in and pick. Um, so one that came up, um, this is from Tony, who asks, um, from oil and gas, Oklahoma, we are working on this effort too. Did you encounter any institutional resistance from oil and gas companies or politicians mm -hmm. with oil and gas associations? Um, yeah, great question. Um, surprisingly, no, uh, that I that I was aware of. I don't know if Ashley and Travis ran up against that. I think because we were able to frame it around freedom, around choice, rather than anti-car or reducing driving, um, we really didn't we didn't speak to that much at all. We didn't really uh, steered away from talking about making people switch to transit or making people switch to um, cycling. It was just, just about providing choice for homeowners and businesses about how much parking they're providing. But the great question, it's, it's it can be tough in oil country for sure. And I mean, really driving home the fact that this is a business friendly decision um, mm -hmm. and helps in that regard. Uh, again, there's a, a pretty big narrative here in, in Alberta around cutting red tape to make our business environment um, more friendly and viable. So, you know, in, in our communications, that was pretty front and center. Uh, but again, you know, we didn't run up against any anyone in particular from the uh, oil and gas industry that was very anti, uh, anti change. Yeah, I mean, certainly there were a couple of people who were very angry that they couldn't find parking for their very large trucks, um, but no organized oil and gas uh, resistance. Got it. Um, this is probably a question for Ashley and Travis. This comes from Rajan who says, have you dealt with secondary suite parking concerns for single family dwellings? Here in Metro Vancouver, we have had many issues regarding the configurations. Do you want to speak to it? Do you want me to go? Here we go. Okay. Uh, so, you know, not really. You know, all of the, the concerns that we have heard so far um, have been related to people being constrained in their built form due to parking minimums. So I think, and you know, this is, this is the, the sort of slow and progressive nature of these types of changes. Um, maybe we'll see something different in the next 30 years. Uh, but like I said, and, and like Anne pointed out, we have such an oversupply of parking as it is today that you know, even if there were, were spillover into uh, surrounding streets or the surrounding neighborhoods, that it, it likely wouldn't be a problem. You know, most people they do have at this point multiple stalls on their lot uh, to to absorb that. So I, I don't see it being uh, a problem here in Edmonton, at least. I, again, maybe that'll change. I, I doubt it will, especially with um, the city of Edmonton's focus on on. Um, light rail transit, our bus networks, and really uh, a focus on creating kind of 15 minute districts where people do have opportunities to um, kind of live, work, play within their existing districts and they don't have to rely so much on a personal automobile just to meet their daily needs. So, you know, parking minimums and, and reducing parking minimums or sorry, eliminating them, it's, it's part of that larger conversation around creating communities that are sustainable, that are less reliant on, on cars. So that's, that's probably how I'd answer that question. Um, because yeah, we, we do exist in that secondary suite ADU space and we don't see many complaints around no parking. Yeah, and I guess there's, there's one thing about our, our built form that I probably would wanna oh, bring yeah. up. Um, so yeah, we have laneways and that means that driveways don't go onto the street. So we have an abundance of street parking. Um, and so, in the city's technical study, it's primarily focused on off street parking, so parking lots. Um, and one thing I guess I would say about Edmonton's on street parking is that outside of the urban core, 
there is just so much on street parking. Uh, we have so much room for absorption in this city. Uh, it might be very different in a place like Vancouver, uh, which has substantially higher densities. You know, just another piece. So um, we did some work with secondary suites as well as uh, ADUs. And one piece that really helped is we had some data and actually I think you collected some of this data was looking at car ownership rates for people who lived in secondary suites. And we were able to find that, yeah, on average, um, folks who live in, in garden garage suites, ADU users or secondary suites were much less likely to own a vehicle as well. So yeah, just another way to allay some of those fears that uh, parking demand is likely to not be a whole new household, like a whole other house moving in. Absolutely. Um... I forgot about that. <laughs> I I did a research study back in 2016 that um, asked that question, and yeah, you're totally right that there is lower lower car ownership in those situations. And I think um, there's a usually um, a higher percentage of folks living in multi generational setups as well if they do have an ADU secondary suite type situation. Uh, so there's much more um, shared shared use of vehicles as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's been a couple of questions kind of piggybacking on what we were just discussing about street parking. Um, Alice asked, um, please speak to the issue of using on street parking as acceptable for businesses. We have a huge amount of on street parking, but our small Minnesota city says it is off limits. And then we also had a question about, um, whether in older neighborhoods that are near commercial districts, there might have been pushback with that concern of people are going to park in my neighborhood and take away the parking spot in front of my house or whatever. Yeah, a um, huge issue. Uh, I don't know that heat map that I showed from the values and priorities survey, parking in front of your house was was such a strong priority for Edmontonians. Uh, it's something people feel very passionate about. Um, and there, there were absolutely concerns about uh, in those commercial areas having having the parking spill over. We also have some uh, some major centers like around the university, and there's a hospital there as well. Um, and those residents um, have a lot of um, yeah a lot of concerns about the parking being generated by those other uses. So this honestly was a conversation that we skirted. We didn't, um, the concerns weren't strong enough to sort of really de derail the conversation that we were having. Um, when it did come up, we again focused on the tools that are available to, to address that. So in some of the areas in Edmonton, we have residential parking programs. So on-street parking is restricted to uh, homeowners in the area. They have to get a parking pass. Uh, but what's really exciting is that the city is sort of taking on that conversation. Um, yeah, I really admire my colleagues at the city who are working on that, my former colleagues, sorry, who are working at the city um, in the uh, sort of the, the on-street parking management group. Um, and it's a tough conversation, but, but really what, what we're trying, what they're trying to get across and a really important message is that you, you do not own the street in front of your home. Um, Everyone who lives in Edmonton is a taxpayer who helps pay for that road infrastructure. And, um, you know, it's really unclear if you think it through logically why we prioritize um, homeowners over other visitors to the neighborhood, uh, particularly because homeowners in the area have the option of parking on their own private property. Um, if they're choosing to use their garage for storage um, and they can't fit their car in there, well, that's, that's their choice. Um, I think, I think there could be some really interesting public awareness campaigns around this. Like I even think about, you know, if you're at a movie theater and someone sits in the row of seats in front of you, you don't yell at them to get out of those seats because you didn't, they're not your seats. You didn't buy the tickets for those seats. And I think that's how we need to start thinking about the road infrastructure in front of our homes as well. Um, there's an assumed ownership, uh, but, but it is not uh, in reality anyone's, it's everyone's street, I suppose. But a thorny issue. I mean, we've had uh, like near violence between neighbors, even just neighbors, neighboring neighbors who all live in the neighborhood fighting over the spaces in front of their homes. So a, a tough, tough nut to crack for sure. And I'm sure even people on this call have seen uh, the pylons that people will place 
on their front street <laughs> as if that is somehow their stall. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a tricky conversation. And um, I remember one thing, now thinking back, I'm like, that was kind of aggressive, but we, <laughs> we would frame it as your garage is probably sitting there as a glorified storage container. And so many people just have junk in their garage. Uh, but you know, if, if that's the space you've designated on your private property for storage, well, you could probably use it to, to house your car, right? So I started, yeah, changing that conversation, coming up with um, some language and some communication around, uh, around that, I think uh, is important. And well, and even flipping it around to say, would it be acceptable for me to store an old couch on the street? Exactly. Like, absolutely not. That would be absurd. I would get a fine. So why is it okay to store my own personal property um, of a vehicle on the public street? So yeah, just trying to, to get people thinking about it a bit differently. Yeah. Um, so this is probably going to be our last question here. Um, but switching gears a little bit, we had a question about um, bike parking or uh, scooter parking, just other options. I don't know if you all have, have done any work on that. If not, that's totally fine. But any thoughts about also encouraging other types of parking to be available for people? Yeah, definitely an important topic. And Edmonton's uh, regulations for uh, bicycle parking were linked to the, per like it was a percentage. So uh, you had to provide 10% of the number of vehicle parking spaces um, ten percent of that had to be given as, as bicycle parking spaces. The number, sorry, not the physical space. Uh, anyway, so when we removed minimums, that technically removed um, bike stall requirements as well. So we had a separate team working on that, uh, developing minimum parking requirements uh, for bicycles. Um, but but a hugely important piece of work, and uh, yeah, something something that has to be considered as part of that equation. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to wrap it up in a second here. Um, I don't want to impose on you all, but if you would be willing to take any additional questions from folks, um, if you're able to like pop your emails back up that, oh, that yeah. share that again. Um, these Absolutely. are all folks that are living busy lives, but they may have time to answer any remaining questions. Um, and certainly encourage you to check out their website. We'll send a follow-up email to everyone with some of those important links um, and the recording of this. Otherwise, um, really quickly, my last uh, note here is that it is our member week at Strong Towns. And if you are appreciating hearing from awesome advocates like these wonderful folks, and you wanna keep supporting other advocates being able to make their community stronger, please join us uh, at strongtowns.org slash membership. And we really appreciate your support. Share that link here. And here are those wonderful folks um, emails to if you're able to follow up on any additional questions. Otherwise, thank you, Ashley, Travis, and um, for sharing all your wisdom, for taking the time. Um, I know I'm seeing in the comments that so many people are working on these issues in their cities and are taking a lot of the wisdom you're sharing to heart. And I'm hoping we're gonna see a lot more parking minimums removed in other cities soon after this. Great, thank so you so much for having us. Opportunity. Yeah, all right, thanks. Take care, everybody.